you, mate. I can't see you. No? Yeah, I can, hear you. I can hear you totally, but I just can't see you. It's like this man of mystery. Well, that's how I like to be known, mate, really. You know me. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Bite Size Cinema. I'm your host, RJ McCready. And for this episode, it could be taking you guys back to the year in 1986 to look at the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. But joining me today is my guest, Dan Bone, from the podcast on Haunted Hill. Dan, how you doing, buddy? Cowabunga, RJ. Cowabunga. Indeed, mate. Indeed, mate. I'll tell you what, I've certainly thrown myself back into the 90s this week, preparing myself for this episode, you know, listening to the music. and um, Oh, yeah. I just can't believe how much nostalgia this film, you know, has created for me. You know, it's just... Um, yeah, totally. I, I agree. Um, I mean, it's a movie I've watched and obviously we'll talk more in detail about yeah. it. But it's a movie I've seen uh, dozens of times, probably, especially as a kid. And it just tipped from the 80s over into the 90s, didn't it? So it's the first year of the 90s. And my God, so the, all the things I used to say, like radical and cowabunga and all awesome you know all those sayings that the turtles say wow <laughs> yeah i know it's so uh, because i've been um i've dug out uh, an album called deep heat 90 oh right um so i've been putting that in the car and i've been listening to all the tunes and stuff like that i think it was like uh de la soul oh yeah and uh you know the hip-hop house music and all that sort of stuff and uh, there was that song i can't remember who's saying it now but it's like jump what jump what jam jitty pretty you're listening to the boys from the oh Big yeah Nerd i know the one yeah. i know the one and they had like pump up the jam pump that's it up, and all those sort of songs <laughs> that's right and you had um you also had jive bunny around about this time as well didn't you oh um, jive bunny the master mixes that was it i think that might have been just on the cusp of the 80s going into the 90s i think a little bit um but before we go into the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Dan, what have you been up to, mate? Have you been watching anything? Any movies or anything like that? Hey, well, firstly, it is hot, isn't it? Ooh. Yeah, big time. Um, it is, I'm just trying to stay cool, you know me, stay cool, freeze. Mm-hmm. But um, what have I been watching? You know me, RJ. Um, yeah. I, I've watched myself a little shark movie. I was going to say, as, uh, as you know, I think I've mentioned that on the... F- uh, this is now the fourth episode, the three episodes that we've been doing. I've been saying, hey, damn, you know, what shark movie you watched this week? So what was it? Some sort of uh, shark versus a alligator yeah, or something like that, was it? it? That's it. It's Mega Shark versus Crocosaurus. Wow. <laughs> and just <laughs> just how bad was it, Dan? It was actually one of the better ones wow. out of the, the bunch. I didn't realise there was four or five of them, um, and there is an order to them, but I've been watching them out of order. I've just been watching them as of when I come across them. It was actually quite good. I still really think Mega Shark versus Mecha Shark was my favourite so far, but <laughs> this one was good. This this was a giant crocodile fighting a giant shark, uh, you know, in the sea, then in the city. It's just nonsense and pure escapism, really. Loved it. The two go together, though, don't they? You know, with the sharks and the alligator, because um, I, just, oh, yeah. I spoke about that in my last episode. I'd look at um, Alligator from 1980, and yeah, um, man. it's not a bad f- film actually. It quite holds up quite well. Um, kind well, of holds its Gavin, own. I man. reviewed that um, oh, one of our first ever episodes actually, um, uh, because it was on YouTube, and we picked a film that we, our listeners could could watch for free and watch along with us yeah. and you're right it, it really holds up so well it's got great actors in it robert force and people like that mm. it's a great movie actually yeah it's um like i say it is a i don't want to say it's a rip-off of jaws but it's certainly got that influence isn't it Do you know what i mean from you know the other films that were kicking around about that time and of course it is another film that is based in the sewers which is a film that we're going to be reviewing today isn't it you know with um they seem to think oh, that yeah. there's they seemed to think there was something lurking in the sewers around about that time, didn't they? Do you know what I mean? You had the to- toxic stuff as well. So you had... Um, I heard you mention this in your latest episode, actually. Uh, it's a film I covered. Is it Chud? Yeah, Chud. Um, and, and then we were talking about Bud the Chud, Chud 2, weren't we, as well? Yeah, which is actually a completely different movie, isn't it? It's a good film, yeah, it's but it's nothing completely to do different. With it. It's more like um, The Return of the Living Dead, in a way, isn't it? Bud, Bud the Chud 2, I think. It's more of a sort of resurrection-type movie. But um, yeah, no, glad to hear you guys might be covering that. Finally get Gav to have a look at that movie, mate. I think he might enjoy it. I don't know. <laughs> and um, I saw you watch Daylight as well the other day, did you, with uh, Sylvester Stallone? Yeah, so I've been watching a couple of older sort of action 
action movie. So I watched Daylight. Um, never seen it before. And uh, was really, really enjoyed that, actually. So sort of same time as we were talking, weren't we? So the same time as Cliffhanger yeah. and all those kind of movies that he was banging out, that Stallone was banging out. It was quite a good movie, actually. Really good explosion scenes at the beginning. And then it's your kind of typical disaster movie. Um, you know, typical characters, some getting killed off. But I, I really enjoyed that. The one I did rewatch though, the other the other night, which God, I, I've forgotten how good that was. And this, I don't know what this says about me when I say this next movie I'm about to say is really good. But I watched Van Damme and Time Cop, and uh, oh, that movie was brilliant, man. I, I really like that movie. It's such a great idea for a film. Yeah, I think um, I don't think it gets well liked, does it, amongst the Van Damme community, but. I always say films work for people, don't they? Do you know what I mean? I, you know, it's, I mean, how can I say it? You know, because there's a lot of films I like which other people don't like. If you know what I mean, but it kind of yeah. Um, that's some. That's it's it's it always amazes me how you get a small percentage of people that really love a movie, and then on a big percentage, you get a lot of people that don't like it, and you kind of go away. And you think, how come everybody doesn't like this film, and I do? Um, I think I brought that up on a. Oh, I know what it is. You know that film I reviewed called The Watchers with yeah. Corey Hayne? Yeah. Another movie I watched and I've gone, how come this film isn't spoken about more? Because it's, you know, it's it's in the 80s, so uh, there's a monster in the woods, it's got Corey Hayne in his heyday, but for some reason it seems to go under the radar. Right. And I'd never heard of it, um, listening to your episode. I think I said to you uh, in a message, I said, man, if I... If I never seen this movie you sold it to me by telling me that Corey Haim and a, a telepathic dog yeah. link up to, to fight a, a government incre- uh, a government experimented Sasquatch is that right is that yeah. what the film is about yeah that's basically it yeah and wow you, yeah I mean if that you know and it's also got um, Michael Ironside in it as well uh, who doesn't have a bit of Ironside well this is it you know what I mean he does turn up an awful lot in these films so um, yeah it's a good movie mate you should go and go and check that out <clears throat> It's on my list. Don't you worry. I'll put it on the list. <laughs> and the other thing I was going to mention, Dan, uh, probably a big segue from what we're going to be reviewing today is actually today, 38 years ago, on the 25th of June, 1982, there was a little film called The Thing that got released in America. So I thought I might just shout that out today as well. Ah, oh, wow. Was that today, was it? Today in America, yes. Only in America wow. it got released. Um, it got released in the UK a in little bit later on in August. But um, yeah. Man. And I've just said to you, just before we started recording, that um, I'm planning tomorrow night to watch that with my dad. What a coincidence. Yeah, I was going to say, I wasn't going to go into that when you said it to me, but I just thought I'll save it for us, you know, when we're recording. But yeah, there you go, mate. It must have been, yeah, must have been your sort of, I don't know, something was sort of obviously uh, drawing you towards That's weird. That. Yeah. Well, it's because I, I bought it for him on Blu-ray for Father's Day, which was recently. Um, it's one of his favourite movies. It's the movie that me and him first watched together, the first horror movie me and him really watched together yeah. when I was younger. Um, so it's got a special place for us, so we're going to sit down tomorrow night and watch that, and that, I'll, I'll enjoy it even more knowing that, you know, it's, it's it's an anniversary. It's crazy when films turn that old. That happened with Jules recently. Do you remember Jules, I think it was last week, turned 45? Wow, did it? Um, wow. And, and that movie's almost 50, you know, a few more years. That movie will be 50 years old. That's crazy. Still scares me even till today, that movie. I oh. don't know what it is about that film, but do you know what I mean? I, as I said before, I can't even go in a bloody bathtub. <laughs> <laughs> it's got the magic though, hasn't it? I think it just captures that magic, really. It is, yes. Um, it has affected me in ways that you could not imagine. And funny enough, uh, Ricky Morgan mentioned it in his podcast you know what's awesome with billy stewart they were talking yeah i about heard that sh- the show they, where they talked about all the jewels or sort of rip-offs yeah he was talking about it and he, he said he actually said something which it almost felt like it walked over my grave because he said when he was a kid he said that he had blue carpet in his hallway oh yeah and he oh, said yeah. he literally had to turn off the light and run across the carpet because he said it looked like water and he thought the shark was going to jump out the carpet and grab him or something. <laughs> and I said, you know, <laughs> I mean, if, if that's not if that's not cinema trauma, I don't know what is. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> well, I had a reoccurring nightmare when I was younger that there was something under my bed. Yeah, I'm um, trying to grab grab my feet and my ankles, so I could never just get into bed when I was younger. I used to have to run and jump and land on the bed. Yeah. And partly that was because of Jules, because I was worried something like something was under the bed or in the water. Um, yeah, oh, God. It's funny how these things affect us. 
And the other one that's uh, going on a massive jaw segue now is the old swimming pool. I kind of have this phobia of a shark in the swimming pool as well after watching that film. Don't know why. <laughs> I thought it was only just me until someone posted it on Facebook a little while ago and I thought, oh my god, it's just not just me then, there is a there's a phobia for that of thinking there's a shark in the water. So yeah, it's man, it's caused me no end of bother watching that movie. <laughs> Bloody Spielberg. <laughs> just for <laughs> just for my little boy just to come out and watch it like recently and say, Oh, you know, it's just a rubber shark, Dad. You know, what's the big deal? Seriously, kid? Oh. Hang on a second. <laughs> Hang on a second. <laughs> You're not supposed to say that. Come on, give your dad a break, will you? That's disrespect. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. But on that night, talking about rubber sharks, cinema trauma, the thing coming out and all that sort of stuff. Shall we have a look at this movie then, Dan? Shall we go into the sewers of New York? Let's get down there, Cowabunga, my dear. Let's Cowabunga. So let's take you guys back to the year in 1990. Let's go into the sewers of New York. Let's play you guys a trailer and will we see you soon? You are here because the outside world rejects you. This is your family. I am your father. You are my eyes and ears. We've been waiting for you, Miss O'Neill. There is a new enemy. Freaks of nature. Together we will punish these creatures. What the heck was that? Looked like sort of a big tiger in a trench coat. Welcome back guys. So the synopsis for this film is four teenage mutant ninja turtles emerge from the shadows to protect New York City from a gang of criminal ninjas. It's an action adventure comedy, it's a PG and it's got a 93 minute runtime. This movie man, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, so when did you first watch this movie? Well, probably around about the year it came out, to be honest with you. It, it was it really caught me and, and every other boy my age and girl, probably, because it was, I mean, you're, the synopsis there, I was getting excited just listening to you say, you know, any synopsis that involves the words gang of criminal ninjas, yeah. that's enough straight away, isn't yeah, it, really? Absolutely. You throw in some ninja turtles into the mix and whew, Um, So... You know the cartoon everyone was watching the cartoon and we had the, some of the toys but when when we heard there was going to be a movie coming out and i remember seeing the trailer as an advert on television in britain and i thought hey, this is actually live action this they're actually talking the words are coming out of their mouths yeah this is going to be insane and we went to the cinema to watch it and it just got me and it's been with me ever since to the point that i i love ninja turtles so much i actually have a Raphael tattoo um, in my I am on my sleeve yeah my, so my sleeve's made up of multiple things that mean a lot to me and there's a couple of he-mans in there and a, even a thundercats mumra logo but there's also um next to battle cat i've got Raphael. um that's how much i love the ninja turtles man so out of uh, interest there dan I'm, I'm interested in this now what you say because you picked Raphael. so obviously there's four ninja turtles all got different sort of personalities which we'll get into so why did you uh pick Raphael? is there some sort of Something you like about that character? Yeah, I, mean, I just love his complexity, you know. Um, uh, and I'm getting, getting serious now with the four personalities. You know, you've got Mikey, he's mm. the goofball. He's all, you're going to have a great time with Mikey, you know. He's the party dude, as they say in the cartoon. Yeah. Donnie was the nerd. I know some friends of mine really 
I think everybody can associate with one of the Tursals in a different way. Leo was the very clean-cut guy who wanted to play by the rules. He's the leader, you know, he, he likes to be the best and get things done. But Raph was just this wild card who was just... He had a, a lot of anger in him. Um, you never knew what he was going to do. He, he always meant well, but he never quite always did it the right way. Mm. And I always, I could always relate to that because I was a bit of a bit of a naughty boy sometimes as we all were when we were kids you know and there was something about Raphael that was just a bit cool it's funny you say that because see um because I haven't seen this film in an awful long time and I remember going to see it at the cinema I really enjoyed it but I haven't seen it for years up until you know we we decided to do it for the podcast and I realized now how much this film actually holds up and I thought this is really good this is actually a really good film <laughs> you know and it's it, with the story and everything but what I noticed is that Raphael is actually out of four turtles, he actually gets more of a how can I say, he gets more of a standout role. Do you know what I mean? Because he does a lot of stuff on his own, doesn't he, throughout the movie. He gets some He's got um scenes. a major arc, hasn't he? Yeah. Um, and and that, that happens quite a lot with his character in, in the cartoons, in the comics, in any of the movies really, the the, the newer movies included. He's always got the biggest arc because he's such a, a wild card. Mm. Uh, you know, he, he always goes against the rest of his brothers. Whereas, you know, like I said, Mikey is a bit more one-dimensional. He's he's just that goofball. Doesn't really ever get up to much. Leo, maybe. Leo's got um, quite a lot of, of, of story arc and stuff going on with him because he's the leader and he struggles to, you know, try and keep his brothers on the straight and narrow. Donnie, Donnie loves April quite a lot. Yeah. In most different media, Ninja Turtles. So he's battling with that, I suppose. But you're right, Raph, in this movie especially, he's got this huge character arc where he's going out on his own and battling with you know who he is and what he is <laughs> i was gonna say dan i must be donnie because i love april as well <laughs> <laughs> man well, well we'll get to that but um i mean she, she she's one of the she's one of those sort of cartoon um you know like janine from ghostbusters people like that you know shira but but in this movie uh the actress that plays her judith hogue she's she's like uh, a young, younger Nicole Kidman, isn't she? Yeah, she's brilliant. She's, she's lovely. Oh, what I liked about her as, as an actress and as a character, she's like a girl next door. Um, she's she's very pretty, very beautiful, very sexy, and everything like that. Can I say that? And um, but it's not over the top, if you know what I mean. Do you know what I mean? It's no, not, totally. It's not like she's very believable as well in this. Uh, she's she's very. She's not just in the movie to look pretty and be rescued. She's no. very ballsy. No, that's um, right. She gets herself into some scrapes, but she she gets her way out of them as well, you know. I mean, yeah. she, she's not a pushover. No. She's certainly not a pushover. And that's what I like about that. Her, her character, there's um, what I liked about watching this as well, because it is a, you know, as I said, it's a hip, it's hip-hop house. It's funky, it's funny, it's comedy, it's action, it's martial arts. But it's also got an awful lot of um, character development to it. Do you know what I mean? They, don't, they spend a lot of time with yeah. the turtles and the mythology of the turtles and... Shredder as well, you know the the bad guys. They, you know, there's a lot of interest, it's quite, a lot of interesting it's, stuff. You know, it's quite incredible that they've crammed all of that into this um, mm. movie that most adults would have seen. Like, I'm sure my parents would have thought it was just a silly movie with puppets, but actually they've crammed. There's a whole thing about, about family and being, yeah. you know, being brothers in this as well. There's there's honor. There's um, you know splinter being their dad and him going missing and them dealing with that loss and that grief for a moment yeah. uh you know and then there's them first coming out into the world and meeting other humans there's so much crammed into this uh, it's not just a silly puppet movie there's so much to it so i've said this before and i'll say this many many times and i stand by this this is one of in my opinion the, the greatest comic book ad- adaptations of all time yeah. um i put this up there with christopher reeve's superman yeah, Michael Keaton's Batman, and this really, you know, there's you got your Spider Mans and whatever else you want to say, but something about the interpretation of, of of the comic book and the cartoon and turning it into this, they just nail it, absolutely nail it. Yeah, what what do you think they nailed it, mate? Do you think it was because, because obviously I was going to say, well, see, what I didn't realise was um, how much of a low budget film this was, and I didn't realise that this was know, actually right? a. Um, one of the most successful independent movies of that time. Mm. It was only made for thirteen million dollars, and it actually made two, two hundred, three hundred million internationally. It, it boomed, and 
I remember it being a big deal as much as you can, do you know what I mean? I, I remember this being everywhere, you know, Turtle Power was big, you know, in the 90s. Um, but the actual, so I'll just have a look at the sort of building block of this movie. So um, no one wanted to touch this film. And funny enough, it was to do with a film that we reviewed, which was Masters of the Universe. Oh, uh, so, yeah. I suppose they would have been stung by that because that flopped in the, in the cinemas, didn't it? Yeah, so when I was doing the notes to this, I was thinking, how the hell could nobody want to touch this? Because of the, the the toys and the comics was doing really well. But then I suppose you could say that the same with He-Man, couldn't you? Do you know what I mean? Because He-Man was doing really well, but unfortunately the film flopped. So I guess studios just, yeah. went, well, I don't want to go anywhere near it. But um, uh, they managed to get a company to distribute it, which is New Line Cinema. And oh, yeah. They, I've heard of them. Yeah, and they they are funny enough. Now here's the here's the thing with New Line Cinema, and there's actually like um, a bookend here. So New Line Cinema is called the distributing company that are the called the house that Freddy Krueger built. <laughs> right, okay. I've heard that that I said about them before. Yeah, because they they um, put some money into Nightmare on Elm Street, or they distributed that film. Obviously, Nightmare on Elm Street did really well, so that gave them the kickstart. Then this film did really well, and then it just kept on going really well for this company. They they got involved with The Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Um, Return of the King was one of their biggest grossing movies. And then well, this is where the other bookmark comes in. So the film that we, we're very familiar with, which has come out in the horror community, which is It, Chapter 1 and 2. Uh, yep. New Line Cinema distributed that movie and it's made a whole ton of money. So you've kind of got Freddy Krueger, one end, it the other end, in the middle of that, you've got Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. There you go. <laughs> that's, a, that's a hell of a sandwich right there, isn't it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> or a pizza, you know. But it's yeah. indeed. Could I have uh, sort of extra cheese with a bit of Freddy Krueger, a bit of a uh, dirty old clown <laughs> out of a drain? <laughs> <laughs> and extra pepperoni, please. <laughs> and a side of hobbits. Yeah, that's it. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> run, Frodo, run. <laughs> so, um, I don't know if you're going to talk about um, Golden Harvest as well being involved in this. Funny enough. Which is oh. very interesting. Yeah, this is the other thing. Yeah, that's right. Gold, Golden Harvest there. So, again, we've spoken about them before, haven't we? With um, Enter the Dragon yep. and, and Please Story. So, Indeed, yeah. So that, that's a link between um, you know the last couple of movies onto this one, and we've talked about how the, the martial arts link, but also Golden Harvest. Uh, so that's another link between these movies as well. So yeah, you guys. So like you say, there's that. Um, funny enough, like you say, we spoke about Into the Dragon, didn't we? And obviously Bruce Lee trying to build that bridge into America, and obviously Jackie yep. Chan, and now you've got the Ninja Turtles, haven't you? Do you know what I mean? So yeah. you've got Golden Harvest and a. American company has made a whole ton of money, so it's 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 actually a very good uh, success story, isn't it, for martial arts to be brought into um, America or the West Side, and then again, you know, like I say, you've got this whole comic book thing with the Ninja Turtles and special effects and all that sort of stuff, and it's such a, it's a different take, isn't it, on the martial arts? I, I, I think the reason it did so well, going back to what you asked me, was yeah, all of those things. It's just perfect timing and a perfect all the ingredients were there and they just had to be mixed in exactly the right way and i think the icing on the cake for me is that jim henson magic yes of course, over the yeah. top of the whole thing mm. yeah i know i mean um, for the budget that they had like so they only had 13 million dollars i mean those creature effects stand up really well you know especially um was it splinter the rat yeah he looks great doesn't he wow he looks amazing do you know what I mean? It's just, it's, it's, it's incredible, you know, puppeteer artwork from, you know, Jim Henderson, um, <laughs> Jim Henderson, <laughs> Harry and Henderson. <laughs> Where did I get Harry and Henderson from? <laughs> Hello, Ernie. <laughs> uh, <laughs> man, where did Bigfoot come into this? Um, <laughs> yeah. So all those um, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles were actually made in his Creature Workshop in London. Funny enough, so um, oh really? And they made they made them in eight weeks, so that's quite a lot. You know, it's quite a quick turnaround. Uh, so yeah, it's you know, kids would have just bought into that because 
you know, with practical effects, we can tell what is and isn't real. There's no CGI in this that I know of, so it's all practical, mm. and it just it's it's compelling. You know, the, the turtles are, are they're there? They're acting with the other actors. It, you know, the suits look great yeah. on the guys anyway. And then the mouth's moving and the eyes looking around, you know, and, and throwing the fact that they're doing bat flips and front kicks and nunchucks. It's just magic. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's, it's everything you want. And like I say, when, you know, when we went to go and watch this at the cinema, I'm sure you was the same as me, Dan, you know, going to watch this. I think I was about 12 years old. It was, it was amazing. And it's a big deal. You know, it's a big deal. Yeah, I seem yeah. to remember it being everywhere. You know, like the merchandise. Everybody was talking about the turtles. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, it was already they already had the springboard of the cartoon um, comics toys, and that's I think what they were afraid of. Because, like you said earlier, that's that's what He Man had. It had a cartoon, it had toys. It should have done really well, but it was left a bit too late because He Man started in like eighty two, eighty three, and they mm. didn't do that movie until eighty seven. And obviously, they had trouble with the funding, etc. As we've discussed. Whereas this was only really a couple of years after, you know, so it was still quite popular and they really jumped on that and they struck while their arm was hot. And, and in fact, this this only went on to create more sequels, remakes, reboots. And do you know what? Ninja Turtles are still going to this day. There's still a cartoon. Mm. Um, you know, there's a cartoon. There was a Nickelodeon show a few years back. You've had four different cartoons. You've had this and it's two sequels you've had um a cgi uh like a computer animated film called tmnt and then you've got the brand two, the new two new ones that have come out in the last couple of years which they kind of got panned but i really like both of those yeah um i, I enjoyed them me and becky watched them one rainy afternoon uh, i think they've put them on netflix or amazon prime and uh i could be honest with you we were entertained and so is Becky yeah. actually because this isn't usually her thing um, but she's loved the Marvel universe so she gave this a go and she said she really enjoyed it and the funny thing is with those, those movies I really enjoyed the um, second movie of the new ones because you had I love the second movie I thought it was really good you know you had Casey Jones in it which was played by yeah uh, Oliver Queen well not Oliver Queen yeah. the guy who plays Arrow and I thought he played, did a really good job you know he's you know badass Stephen Amell. Um, I'm a big fan of him, actually, because I really watched, I love the Arrow show. So I was really excited to hear he was playing Casey Jones. Yeah, I thought he did it really well. And uh, apparently he's a nice guy in real life as well. I think, uh, I can't remember who's telling me that. Uh, I think it might have been Gary Hill or someone. You know, because Gary Hill's met an awful lot of people. I don't think he's he has, yeah, he has. He's a really nice guy. I've got a bit of a man crush on Stephen Amell. I follow him on all social media, and you're right, he's an incredibly lovely guy. Um, <laughs> you know what, Dan? Yeah. I think we all have, mate. Just just don't tell anybody. <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> no one's, no one's going to hear this, is there, are they? No one's going to hear this. <laughs> <laughs> like, I open up my locker at work, and there's a Stephen Amell poster in there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't, mind, don't mind that. I'm just a big fan of uh, Arrow. That's all it is. Yeah. <clears throat> Absolutely no, nothing wrong with a man crush, mate. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. <laughs> um, so, we are talking about the ninja stuff, and that's that's quite a good thing to talk about as well, because um, that actually caused quite a lot of problems, didn't it, for this movie? Uh, I think you mentioned that before with yeah. the, was it Nunchucks? They actually thought this film was violent, didn't they, back in 1990? Yeah, so, I mean, Since I touched it. on this when we covered Enter the Dragon, and... Yeah. and you know, when Ninja Tur- when the Ninja Turtles first got released in the UK, it was actually changed to Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles. Mm. Um, they cut out any wor- use for the word ninja, and they cut out any use of Michelangelo's nunchucks, which is weird because Leonardo and Raphael can still walk around with swords and daggers, but yeah. Michelangelo's not allowed to use two sticks with a bit of chain between them. <laughs> yeah, I think, I, think, um, I think a lot of it was to do with the fact that kids were getting these nunchucks and just trying to throw them around and hit them in the face or something like that I think but uh, <laughs> I mean, we've all done it uh, yes. uh, cracking yourself in the head you know <laughs> god yeah still do it now <laughs> I've got a set of nunchucks actually uh, that my brother made me um, he used to be a woodworker and uh, yeah he made me a set of nunchucks and he made himself a set so we we used to practice a lot yeah. with them and I got quite good um, at one point but I, I've got I bruises all over my arms to show for it <laughs> Um, but you know when 
when I watched this as a 12 year old I had no issues with the violence in this film I, I, I didn't really think it was a particularly violent movie I just thought it was um, how can I put it just sort of animated fantasy violence nothing I wasn't really nothing that was new to me and that's no, no discredit to this movie but you know I watched films like Krull Masters yeah. of the Universe and films like that, you know, even Ghostbusters, you know what I mean? It just, for me, it was, it was that sort of fantasy violence. So There was no blood um, in this. There was no stabbing, even though there were swords and daggers. It was, you know, a kick to the face or the head. You didn't really see anybody bleeding or anything like that. It, it was cartoon violence. Yeah. It is cartoon violence. And, and that was fine. And actually, there were some, there are some darker elements in this film, but... The storytelling is so fantastic that uh, even as a child, you know you wouldn't ever want to be in that scenario. That's not a cool scenario. These kids aren't doing anything cool. They're doing something very dodgy. And, mm. and at the end of it, they all learn a lesson. We all learn a lesson. And it's just told very well. Um, yeah. 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 It's got some very, like say, some deep bits in it and stuff like that. Um, I'll just shout out who who's in this movie. So you've got Judith Hogue as April O'Neil. Uh can't pronounce this guy's name. Elias Cotis. I think Casey Jones. Oh, yeah. Jones, uh, Elias Cotis, yeah. Casey Man. Jones. I, I, as you know, I have problems pronouncing these names. <laughs> uh, Joss Pays as Raphael. David Foreman as Leonardo. Leif Tilden as Donatello. And that was obviously, as you know, Dan, that was voiced by Corey Feldman, who we're both big fans of. Pizza dude! Yeah, do you know what I mean? And and on a, on a segue with Corey Feldman, I mean, that guy's just been in everything, hasn't he? Do you know what I mean? Everything, if I was an actor, you'd just want his CV, wouldn't you? Do you know what I mean? As a child actor, you know, oh, like yeah. The Goonies, Stand By Me, Gremlins, you know, The Burbs, you know, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, The Lost Boys, yeah. you know what I mean? You think, wow! A couple know. of uh, Friday, the, Friday the 13th movies as well, you know, yeah. it's just... You know, what, what, a, what a career that guy's had, do you know what I mean? As a... As an actor, I think it's fantastic. And this is a guy that talks like a Ninja Turtle, so he was perfect to <laughs> yeah. voice one of them. He had to voice one of them, didn't he? Do you think he got put in a mic and he really tried to put on an accent and then the director went, no, it's all right, Corey. Sorry, just be yourself, mate. <laughs> it's okay. I think, I think that's it because he's... And it's strange that he plays Donatello, who's like the most sort of chilled out of the bunch, really. Yeah. Um, I thought he would have played like Mikey or somebody, but it doesn't matter. It still works. He plays it so well. Yeah, that's it. That's right. Because um, yeah, when you when you see him, well, you see him in most of the movies. But his characters in this reminds me of the same character out of um, the Burbs. He really does. It even says Pizza Dude at one that's point, it, yeah. just like he does in the Burbs. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Lamo, get off my lawn. <laughs> Pizza Dude. <laughs> No tail lines. Hey, don't go yet. <laughs> Pizza guy's about gonna arrive. Come on. I love him. Love him. What was his name in that? Ricky. Uh... Ricky Butler. Ricky Butler. That kid's a meatball. That's it. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> that kid's a real meatball. Oh dear, Dan. Don't, let's, not, let's not get started with the burbs. <laughs> You know what it oh, gets. Carry on, with the, carry on with the cast. Sorry, I've interrupted no, no, no. my Corey Feldman tangent. No, no, that's all right. You know when it gets hot, it gets really hot and it starts drifting down the back. <laughs> anyway, it was hot. <laughs> I had to chuck that one in. Red sky at night, it would take flight. <laughs> oh, all right, okay, so uh, this is our burb segue there, mate. Oh, mate, let's not get started on that. <laughs> so, there's some of the cast, just to name some some of the few. And we mentioned the merchandise, like I say, this, this film had a ton of... Video games, toys, T-shirts, posters, vinyl records, didn't it? It was just... Everywhere you looked, there was <laughs> turtles, wasn't there? Even the soundtrack did really, really well, didn't it? it was a, oh, yeah. It, it, like I say, I listened to that soundtrack in my car the other day, and wow. It, I think the soundtrack was just as big as the movie, wasn't it? And, you know, when you think about it, this was 1990. I mean, what a turnaround from the 80s to the 90s I mean this film was almost I look at it now as if it's like a gateway into the 90s you know with the hip hop yeah, yeah, house totally. music and all that sort of stuff you know it's just um, yeah just amazing um, what was the other thing I was going to mention as well I think that might just be it um, oh yeah that's the other thing <laughs> uh, so Pizza Hut 
at this time. Pizza. They, yeah. So they're not in the movie, so it's actually Domino's Pizza. But Pizza Hut, they actually invested more money than this movie was made. They've invested $20 million on a Teenage Mutant Tur- Turtle campaign for merchandise, you know, because obviously the pizzas and all that. So, yeah, $20 million campaign. And they weren't even in the film, but I think they did all right out of it. But um, this, this was a juggernaut. This movie was a commercial juggernaut, like Ghostbusters, you know, like the Batman movie, like and then Ninja Turtles. That's what He Man didn't do. But those movies I've just mentioned, they all captured it. They, something about, you know, this didn't even have a logo like Ghostbusters or Batman. They had logos, easy to put on things. But this was just like these green guys with bandanas, and you could just buy them on anything, whether it was sticking them on the car window, whether it was a t shirt, a pillow, a, a sleeping bag, cereal, cartoons, comics. You, you couldn't avoid it. And parents probably hated it because they wanted their kids wanted everything with a Ninja Turtle on it. Oh, yeah. really? You want that as well, do you? All right, okay. Well, this is it, and I think this is what makes the movie, isn't it? And I think you just hit, you've just ultimately hit the nail on the head there, Dan, with this. Because you look at Batman that came out the year before this, that had a massive merchandise um, thing about it, didn't it? You know, with um, stickers, t shirts, like I say, logos. Even Ghostbuster did back in 1984, you know, it also yep. had uh, Ray Parker Jr., didn't it? The soundtrack. Oh, yeah. Big. I mean, that, that's, that in itself is one of the best advertisements for a uh, movie ever, really, isn't it? Yeah, so you can imagine that people, if they hear the song, they'll go, I want to go and watch the film. So you've already got that sold already, haven't you? And the same with, you know, Turtles. You've got the um, Partners, you know, was it Partners? Partners in Crime. Partners in Crime song that came out. Yeah. Uh, but unfortunately, like you say, with Masters of the Universe, it didn't actually have that campaign, did it? Or a soundtrack or song. Uh, the soundtrack was good to that film, but just didn't have that, did it? And I think there was no merchandise good. off of the Masters of the Universe movie, really. There was two or three figures that they put out as the line was coming to an end, as the toy line was coming to an end. And there was no, there was no comic. There was, I mean, there was already, it, it was dying already. That, that line was already dying, really. Um, They'd left it too late. Yeah. This was just in his infancy, and this was the springboard. That, and and it, like I've said, it's still going now. You know, 1990. Yeah. We're on 2020 now. You can still buy stuff with Ninja Turtles on it everywhere. This is it. Yeah, it still goes on till today. So, shall we have a look at this movie then? Make sure we do a bite-sized review of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Let's get let's get into it. Let's get some pizza. Let's get some and, pizza. Uh, let's get radical. <laughs> All right, Dan, as, as, as I love your storytelling, mate, as I said before, take it away, mate. Take us back to 99. <laughs> Let's talk about this movie. Man, this movie. So we start off in New York, uh, and I love I love it. It's so busy. Um, you know, we're introduced to April, yeah. um, and we're thrown straight into this story. April O'Neill, she works for Channel 6 News, I think it is, and she's reporting on these this organized crime unit, you know, and we get to see these... Um, loads of snippets of people doing pickpocketing and it's very uh com- complex like someone will steal a wallet and they'll walk somewhere else somebody take that wallet from them then they'll take that wallet to them and tvs are being taken and you know mm, that's quite a funny scene you, actually isn't it because you, you actually see this it's hilarious. Lady, there's a lady on the balcony isn't there and she's watching her TV and she just looks away and you see TV just sort of fly away, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> and that guy, that guy that's delivering, like, he's got a lorry of parcels. Yep. And uh, he, he goes off, gets one signed for him, and he comes back, the whole lorry's empty. And he's like, <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, also notice that um, Shredder is actually involved in this, isn't he? Because that kid nicks a wallet and then you see his hand just a little, just appear a little bit and then just moves away. So... Um, Oh yeah, so we know we know that there's ninjas and, and Shredder, the leader of the ninjas, is involved in this as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we also see a bunch of the ninjas loading TVs into the back of a car. So not only are they ninjas, but they're also like an organised crime unit. Yeah. So uh, it's not not a good time for New York, and this is all over the news at the moment in New York. And April is the one to report on it. She is the number one reporter. Uh, I love the bit where um, I can't remember who says it now. But somebody says. Who are you going to call? Did you catch that when April yes, said, I, I think did. it's April that says, who are you going to call? I also noticed that there was a, a Super Mario reference as well as they went past the van. 
Um, the oh, fan, I didn't see that. Yeah, so the van, which you just said, all the stuff that got nicked out of the back, it was Mario's. Ah, yeah, so see? I, just, I thought I'd just noticed a little reference there to that, so yeah. See, you can't get much more 90s than that, really. A lorry load of Damn. Super Mario Brothers games. <laughs> <laughs> you, you cannot get any 90s in this because crime is stealing wallets. That's what the bad guys are doing. <laughs> That's all they're doing. They're just stealing wallets and TVs. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> well, April has worked late that night doing her report and she, yeah. um, she leaves the studio. Um, and as she's leaving, she heads to her rust bucket of a van uh, and she accidentally bumps into a gang of thieves who are like loading a lorry or something uh oh they're after her now so they end up trying to mug her they kind of push her about a bit but then out of the shadows this uh this sigh this dagger appears and flies through the air hits a light and the light sort of goes in and out and in and out and then we hear a lot of sort of commotion in the darkness we don't see anything because it's a ninja that's doing this and they keep to the shadows and then the lights come back on as the cops pull up and april's kind of sat on the ground almost with birds flying around her head like what just happened and all the bad guys are tied up and uh, uh and, and it, it's Raphael. spoiler alert you know we, we know that it's Raphael from his signature dagger but yeah she's just been rescued by a ninja turtle hasn't she that's right and she's also wearing her uh, yellow mac as well isn't it i think that's the only time she wears it in this film isn't it it's like a bit of a homage to her was it cartoon comic book character who she wears like a yeah. yellow jumpsuit or something didn't she? she wore a yellow jumpsuit apparently she was quite difficult um in this judith hoag she didn't want to wear the jumpsuit yeah and she could be quite difficult on set sometimes as well i mean it doesn't come across in the movie and i no, still love her in no this, that's but... right yeah but no apparently that's i read that as well that's the reason why uh, I think they wanted her to have a yellow or have a yellow theme in this, didn't they? Yeah, the she didn't agree with that, but she she agreed to wear the yellow coat at the beginning, like you say. So it works, you know. Uh, it's you a know. nod now. I wouldn't have even noticed that as a kid. I'd have just thought, well, that's April. She's got red hair. Boom, I'm that's that, I'm really. I'm sure Gary Hill would agree with me right now. She just wears a little pencil skirt for the rest of the movie. That's fine. That's she- fine. She is not wearing appropriate clothing for running around <laughs> and doing adventures with Ninja Turtles. Absolutely Her skirts not. are ridiculously yeah, short, aren't they? They certainly are. <laughs> I did not. I think I, know, I think I noticed that when I was twelve as well. <laughs> no wonder the no wonder the turtles are always sort of like Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> radical, dude. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, like I say, it was Raphael that rescued her, and because he threw one of his daggers, he leaves it. It's kind of left on the side and you just catch him poking out the sewer and he's really angry with himself because April looks round while the police are sort of picking up the pieces and she grabs the dagger and she puts it in her handbag. So he's really annoyed with himself because he's he's lost one of his, his signature weapons there. Um, so that's your opening sort of couple of scenes really. And then we kick into this awesome score, very 90s. And it. we get our introduction to the four brothers, don't we? That's right. Like you say, you've got that sort of... Did it, did it, did it, did it, did it, and you that score. Oh, I love it. it. Yeah. I love that music, man. Yeah. I was, I, was, I was listening to that in the car the other day. I was just sort of put the old volume up and that, you know. I thought, yeah, this is great. <laughs> well, we, we meet the four brothers, the yeah. four Ninja Turtles, and they're so excited because that was actually their first... We find out that was their first almost mission out into the real world. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and they've, you know, they've foiled a crime and they're really sort of high-fiving each other and cowabunga radical awesome they're saying all those cheesy things that we love so so much but Raphael isn't getting involved he's really pissed off behind them and he's like damn it and that's because he's so complex RJ like I said he's so much going on in that head of his um you know anger he's just trying to bring them down (laughs) yeah he's trying to bring them down to a level isn't he that sort of ninja sort of calm vibe but even when he says right we're going to do some meditation now isn't it and then all of a sudden you get that did it, did it, did it, did it, did it, you know, they sort of like dancing around, don't they? Do you know what I mean? This is meditation, isn't it? You know, like proper teenagers. And I said earlier, this so is good. like the, um, this is the character development, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? These guys are real, aren't they? Do you know what I mean? They all got, like, say, their own personalities. And, like I say, got Splinter trying to, he's like the father figure, isn't he? Trying to control these kids, yep. isn't he? So, and, uh, yeah, it's great. <laughs> they, uh, they absolutely nail the four indi- individual personalities in this mm, movie um right. you know 
and we introduced to them very quickly you know we already knew them as kids but for anyone that hadn't seen it they would learn who these guys were you know one's really cool uh, and a bit rough around the edges one's the leader another one is a bit of a nerd and a geek and then you've got mikey who's just off the chain he just yeah. does whatever he loves pizza and having a party and you get that straight away they get back and they tell splinter what they've done oh we did it we did this we did that and splinter's like as long as you remained unseen don't forget the code of the ninja and he's yeah. always been the dad also he's the sensei as well so he's got that responsibility as well and then whilst all this is um, happening, it's got I, I like it where he's talking. All of a sudden, you remember those old tele, <laughs> you remember those old telephones where you used to have to wind it round, didn't you? Like, yeah, yeah. you just hear that in the background <laughs> as he's talking. It's like Mike and Angelo's on the phone ordering a pizza, really. yeah. extra pepperoni, yeah, <laughs> and cheese. I love that <laughs> because Splinter's giving this huge speech about how important it is to remain unseen and yeah. <laughs> only use your, your your martial arts for good. And then in the background, he's like. Yeah, okay, and don't be late. Otherwise, yeah. I know you get a 10% discount. And he's like, yeah, yeah dude. <laughs> and they've ordered pizza, and they're all like, yeah, pizza, dude. Like you said, they're teenagers, man. They're yeah. just real and, kids. And you, know, you know what, Dad? It, this whole, when I watched this the other day, I thought, I knew I was, I know I'm watching a 90s movie, and you get a dude turn up on a motorbike with a pizza, and it's like someone talking out to have a bloody drain in the road. <laughs> it's like ten dollars that comes up, and then the dude just like passes the pizza down into the train. I thought, man, this is the nineties. That's the nineties. Because right he's, he's he's looking around, going apartment C. Yeah, I can only see a, an A and a B, and then I don't know where the other apartment is. And then the money comes out the drink. He's, yeah, he did. <laughs> <laughs> and he he just doesn't find that weird at all, does he? Just like, yeah, okay, man, there you go. <laughs> He says, I think he says, oh, I've got to get another route. And he just gets back on his boat and drives it, yeah. off. That's it, yeah. And he says, oh, three dollars short. And then Mike Urge goes, well, you should have been earlier next time or something like that. It's just, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> it's brilliant. Yeah, it's so great funny. Scene. It's yeah. so, so funny. Um, well, that's the, the three brothers, Leonardo, Donatello and Michelangelo. They're enjoying pizza with their dad, Splinter. But Raph has gone out. He's angry. He's an angry young teenager. And he's gone out in disguise. Now, I say disguise, RJ. Um, he's wearing a giant coat and a hat with a backpack. What What do you think about this disguise? Does it work as a disguise? Well, apparently, apparently it does in New York, doesn't it? Because... <laughs> <laughs> when, when he, a little bit later on, I'll just fast forward here, just a little bit, when he jumps over that taxi, and the bloke, it, what the hell was that? And then the taxi driver, oh, it's just a, just, just a guy, it's a turtle in a trench coat with a hat, that was all, oh, says, right, okay. looks like a, a big toy in a trench coat. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, oh, so the guy, the guy that gave them the pizza, he was actually one of the actors that played one of the turtles. Oh, um, right, okay. All right. And the guy in the back of the taxi, who says, what the hell was that? He was the, another, another one of the turtles. So all four of the actors got a little cameo in this at some point. I don't know if I can remember where the, the other ones are, but I might do as we come around to it. But yeah, yeah so they were yeah, in that. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, now we get Raph now. I love this scene where Raph... So Raph's gone to the cinema on his own, and he's gone to watch Critters. Mm, I noticed which... that. Yeah, I did notice that. Actually. I don't know what the <laughs> reference... I don't know if there's a reference there or what. I don't know. I was trying to sort of look well, at it. He comes out and he says... He looks at, up at the sign and shakes his head. Obviously, he's not enjoyed himself, and he just sort of says, "Like anybody would believe that," or something <laughs> along those lines. You know, so it's kind of a bit of a reference. Apparently, they were really, really, really trying to get Batman um, it, it, as the the movie that he'd gone to see, and the line would have been, oh, "Cool car, shame about the bad suit." Oh, um, right. oh, okay. But they they couldn't get the rights or something like that, and, and yeah. Batman had only just come out i think batman it? had only just come out yeah so yeah. they they went with critters in the end but, wow. um, still quite cool that they, they yeah that I, I like that i like that little reference there. it's cool yeah it's cool man well um Raphael, as i've said he's, he's just come out of the cinema and he's wandering along and he spots some muggers so he stops 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 these muggers in the park and this is where we get introduced to elias cotius aka casey jones He's a badass, isn't he? Do you know what I mean? I actually come away from this film thinking oh, I'm a big fan of this character because he's just, he's great, isn't he? Do you know what I mean? He's really, really cool. And I, I like the way they picked his char- um the actor as well. Cause yeah. Because he, he's, um, I like, like I say, I liked Oliver Queen guy 
Um, so was it Stephen Amell who did it? But in this time, he just yeah, the guy who plays Casey Jones in this, he just I don't know, he just seems believable. He's got long hair, isn't he? He's not particularly muscle bound, ripped or anything like that. But he just he can hold his own. He's got a bit of muscle, and he you know he just he's got the attitude. And I just felt like he was a '90s dude. You know, that's how you yeah. were in the '90s with the hip hop thing and all that sort of stuff. So. Yeah, it's great. The, the 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 only issue I had with Stephen Amell is he's a very clean cut, nice guy. And yep. actually, in the comic books and in the cartoons, Casey Jones is actually slightly unhinged. You know, yep. he wears a, a, mm. a hockey goalie mask. You know, a, a, um, and he goes out and he carries weapons like hockey sticks and cricket bats. The guy's clearly unhinged. He thinks he's a vigilante. He doesn't know any martial arts really. He just goes out and beats people up with baseball bats. But he becomes friends with the tourists and actually he's actually was always my second favorite character after Raphael out of any character yeah. i loved casey jane so his interp this interpretation of him is brilliant if you ask me yeah, yeah no, i loved brilliant. it I, I like to say after watching this again i just thought he he almost stole the show for me he didn't because all, all the characters blend in pretty good on this but do you know what I mean he's he's almost like a sort of show stealing character he, you know, he had some fantastically funny he's almost like the comic relief at times as well because uh, he's he plays it like a little bit dumb here and there plus he's trying to He's trying to hook up with April as well, you know, and plus he's trying to understand these four turtles guys. He's, in, he's a bit of a fish out of water in this situation. So he really yeah. is, he's almost like the audience, isn't he? It's well, just like, who is, he doesn't know what's going on. Do you know what, Dan? He could even hang out with the two guys out of, uh, like he could hang out with Bill and Ted, couldn't he? If he come out after, he, he, could. he went, well, I'm just by myself this days because my two other friends they got into this telephone box and it just disappeared. So it's just me now. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> it's like something like that. Because <laughs> he's part of that sort of league, isn't he? Do you know what I mean? He's just you know he's a dude. <laughs> so I could totally see that. <laughs> he is a total dude, and because he is a vigilante, so he spots Raphael fighting these two guys. He doesn't realise that Raphael is obviously a goodie uh, mm. and has stopped a mugging. So he just sees a guy fighting two other guys and he says, all right, I'm going to have to fight you now. So they have a little bit of a, a scrap, um, pulls out a baseball bat yeah. and Raphael does some flips and some kicks. They, they, they're kind of matching each other really, blow for blow. Um, although Casey does, doesn't really know any ninjutsu, he's still, you know, got a lot of heart and he, he's really going for it. They're both on the same side, but they don't know it at that time. I love the line where um, he's tried a, uh, I think he's tried a baseball bat, maybe something else, and then he pulls out a cricket bat. Now, yeah. a lot of Americans wouldn't really be very familiar with cricket. And I love that because Raphael says, cricket, to understand cricket, you've got to know what a crumpet is. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and like I say, he does actually kick the arse out of Raphael, doesn't he? Because it sort of shows how strongly he must be because he's flipped, like say, he flips him over, doesn't he? Yeah. Uh, to the point that, that in the end, he's like, actually, I'm just going to run off now. And Raphael gives chase, but he doesn't quite catch up with him, does he? No. And, and that's the last you so, see yeah. him until later on when he turns back up again. But yeah, no, he's a cool character. A bit later on. So Splinter has a bit of a word with Raph about his behaviour and says, you know, you really need to calm your anger down, you know. Mm. The usual sort of teenage typical stuff that we get. <clears throat> um, we get a bit of a side story with April's boss who has a son called yeah. Danny. And Danny's going to be our lead into the baddies because Danny's actually going to end up falling in with the bad guys for a little bit in this. Um, so yeah, that, that's that's going to come up in a moment. The turtles do get to watch April on TV. Um, so before they even get to meet her, they've already seen her on TV, and they love her, don't they? Yeah, they're kissing the TV, aren't they? Like teenagers. <laughs> it was April O'Neil, wasn't it? Kissy, kissy, kissy. <laughs> she's she's a like I mentioned earlier in the intro. Like she is a real badass character. She's. Yeah. Um, She's going to the chief of police and she's saying to him, what are you going to do about this so-called foot clan, this ninja clan? What are you doing about it? Are you taking it seriously? Because these are more than just rumours and the, she's really making him sweat, you know, on, on TV and, and, and in all the interviews she does with him. And uh, Shredder is watching TV, as Shredder would do, of course. And uh, he, he sees her saying all this about the, and he sees her name the Foot Clan specifically, which is is his ninja clan. Yeah. And he just turns to somebody off camera and says, 
find her and silence her. <laughs> That's it. So she is in trouble. Yeah, and it's I, very I, simple. Very simple storytelling, but it works perfectly. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's all you need, though, isn't it? With these films, you just want a simple plot, don't you? With all the other great stuff around it, that you know, feel, builds it all up together nicely, doesn't it? Do you know what I mean? And, and the other thing, it goes at a nice pace as well, doesn't this film? Do you know what I mean? It sort of just doesn't oh, hang yeah. about, gets you to where it needs bang, to bang, go. Bang, 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 bang. Thinking about it as well, I've just, just, uh, I'm just thinking. You know, we compare this to Masters of the Universe and why that didn't and why this did work. I was not disappointed with any single interpretation of a character in this. Um, every character looked like who I thought they should look like, whether it was Shredder, Splinter, the Turtles, Casey Jones, April. Whereas in He-Man, we talk about, oh, there was no Orko, there was no Battle Cat. We had a He-Man, we had Tila, but none of them really looked like they did in the comics or the toys. And I think in this, they managed to nail that, didn't they? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you had them all there, didn't you? And you... you... And uh, Rick said this with uh, Big Trouble in Little China, which we just reviewed. And he actually said that you watch the some films you can watch and you actually like all the characters. So some people even like David Lopan because he was just he's he's the bad guy, but he's a good bad guy. He has, he's got a lot of character to him, do you know what I mean? And I think Shredder's the same with this, do you know what I mean? He's he's a bad guy. Obviously that's you know, he's he's a nemesis, but he's he's a good good bad guy do you know what I mean he's got all these powers and he's really good he's, he's tangible as well isn't he you know because he's obviously had to train himself to be as powerful as he is you know um, but yeah it's just... he's got a, like you said he's got that presence because there's that moment later on where he arrives and it's like something from Star Wars like with Darth Vader turning up when he arrives and you see that shadow mm, that's right that yeah is it playing and you're like whoa who's this guy in fact it's funny you say because I watched um when I was watching this, I actually thought there was a bit of a Star Wars element in this because, you know, of the whole, you know, the Jedi thing, isn't there? You know, with almost like Spencer being Obi-Wan Kenobi, the Ninja yeah. Turtles being like Luke Skywalker, uh, Casey Jones being like Han Solo, isn't he? You know, he's like the sort Definitely of, Han Solo, definitely. Um, and then you've got, um, you know, the news reporter being, you know, I suppose she's like the princess, isn't she? Princess Leia. But again, but... Even in Star Wars, Princess Leia as a character, she held her own, didn't she? In A New Hope, wasn't she? She was a bad Absolute badass, badass. So, wasn't she? So, um, and the funny thing is, I suppose, you know, going into that, George Lucas did actually base Star Wars on the martial arts world, didn't he? So I suppose this is where we're going. This is where we're seeing those similarities, isn't it? Um, yeah, yeah, he based it on like samurai culture and things like that. Yeah, yeah totally, yeah, totally. The whole sort of meditation thing and all that. So. Yeah, I guess like you said, this movie it does move at such a great pace, and it knows exactly what buttons to press because we go straight from what we've just what's Mm. just happened with Casey Jones straight to April being attacked in a subway by the the Foot Ninjas. Um, She gets knocked out, and this is where Raphael gets to step in and and kick total butt. He like takes on all all of these ninjas. Like again, it's all it's the Raphael show, isn't it? Really, up, up until now. Yeah, that's right. That's what I thought when I watched it. I thought he's the guy who's actually taking the lead, isn't he? Even though, like you're saying, Leonardo is the leader, isn't he, of the pack? But Raphael sort of—it's kind of like his movie, isn't it? Really, with the other guys. Um, but I like it because he gets to fight with his trench coat, doesn't he? Is it? Where, has he got his trench coat? Yeah, on man. He's, yeah, he's got his trench coat on, on the subway. Yeah, yeah. It's, and he's cocky as well when he fights. He's like, "Come on, is that all you got?" And he's saying things like that. Like he's proper Brooklyn. Like yeah, he's the it. only one with a Brooklyn accent. The other guys are in New York. He's like proper. Like, hey, come on, <laughs> Mikey. <laughs> oh, it's brilliant. And so, well, this, he takes he takes her home, doesn't he? He does. Yeah, it's a, it's a quick date. <laughs> so he's back <laughs> home with her, isn't he? <laughs> My favorite is when Mikey sees her sleeping and he says, "Whoa." Can we keep her? <laughs> <laughs> oh, and this is that's where the teenage thing comes in, uh, isn't it? With all quotes like that, isn't it? Yeah, it's great. She wakes, she wakes up, and she obviously freaks out because she's first of all introduced to a giant rat who's like, "Allow me to explain what's been going on," and she's like. Like, ah, you're talking. She starts like freaking out, and then she turns around, and there's four green guys who are like, "Hey!" <laughs> She's like, "What the fuck is going on here?" <laughs> um, and then uh, Splinter, very quick, quick to give his back 
back, their backstory to her. He says, sit down, I'll, I'll tell you how it all came to be. And he tells her the entire story 15 years ago. Oh, and yeah. he goes, that whole backstory that we all know with the ooze and everything. Is this, is this quite a funny scene, actually, isn't it? Because you've got that funny instrumental music and you is it is this where you've got um splinter is a tiny little rat and he's doing some training yeah he's doing some yeah, stop, anima- stop animation <laughs> moves isn't he my master taught taught me the ways of the ninja <laughs> he's kind of doing some training in the cage isn't he and stuff yeah but. i i gotta be honest this is the one bit of the movie that i always like, find a little bit cringy and i even did as a kid but mm. do you know what just accept it because uh, yeah, we're right. watching a movie about giant ninja turtles do you know what i mean well this is it because it made me laugh when one of the ninjas they get the bit of ooze didn't they the turtles and he's he, and he said yeah. he's, and he said his first word and he's like pizza pizza <laughs> 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 like, you know, this dude's never seen a pizza before but he's no and pizza said- <laughs> <laughs> the first words, the first word is a ninja turtle was pizza, and then pizza, the other one's yeah. like radical. <laughs> That's it, yeah. And that that music in the background just made me laugh. I can't. It's all did 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 did. She now she now understands you know, where they're from, where they're at, and she kind of trusts them a bit. You know, they one of them saved her from these ninja guys, so they yeah. say, look, look. It's not safe. They're obviously after you for some reason. Let's take you home. So they, they walk her through the sewers and and they're like, right, well, stay safe. You know, she lives above an antique store that she kind of half owns and half runs. So they're like, see ya. And she's like, I'd invite you guys in, but I, I don't have anything to eat other than frozen pizza. Yeah, that's it. She said the magic word there, <laughs> didn't she? That's it. Awesome. And Radical. Mikey, Mikey's like, yeah, like the drain, it. like, what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, so they, they go in and this is a great scene a great bonding scene now where Mikey's doing a Rocky impression oh yeah that's right yeah, that's uh, you know that, and they're, they're, she's really finding out that these are just four teenage boys really they're, they're just like having fun yeah. she gets to know all their personalities they're eating pizza and chilling out it's a really lovely scene and, and, and just uh, the chemistry between Judith Hogue and, and, and these four guys effectively in suits with robotic heads just brilliant yeah. it just works so well you get the feeling that they really are bonding over pizza it's brilliant they're, 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 they're very easy to make friends with aren't they the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles all you need is some pizza some obviously some Rocky movies or something <laughs> like that do you know what I mean you know, they're your mates aren't they they're going to look maybe after a, you, you know maybe I mean? a pinball machine in the corner <laughs> yeah that's it you know they're, they're, they're easily placed and they're just and they would be just a bunch of fun guys to hang out with wouldn't they do you know what I mean Especially in, in today's times, really. we could do with some Ninja Turtles, can't we, to hang out with? <laughs> I'd love to hang out with them in the, in the sewers. <laughs> God almighty. Be a bit hot down there now, though, <laughs> wouldn't it? <laughs> in this heat. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah, it'd be a bit smelly, I think, as well. Yeah. Go and sweat yourself off down in the sewer with a Ninja Turtle. One thing I, right. That's one thing I always think about. I, I might, uh, And as a kid, this is my kid logic, right? Yeah. I always used to think, like, they live in the sewers. Mm-hmm. There's obviously loads of shit in the sewers, so yeah. they, it must stink. But then I always looked at the turtles and thought, oh, they don't have any noses. That's, That's my kid point. logic. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, because you do think like that as a kid, do you? Don't you come away with those questions, don't you? Sort of that sort of 12-year-old way of thinking. But yeah, it's a valid point, eh? <laughs> God. Imagine, well, imagine... the turtles leave April's place and... Sorry, dude, carry on. I was going to say, just imagine if some turds got into that fucking ooze. <laughs> oh, God, what would happen? Turds with teeth. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so I just had to sort of, that's another way of 12 year old thinking for me at the cinema. Do you know what I mean? What if this happened? What if that happened? <laughs> Thank God it didn't. His first words were. Poop. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, they they do they leave April's place after filling up on pizza, and they get back, and this is where the movie really starts picking up pace now, mm. because they get back, and their lair, their sewer lair, has been trashed, and and Splinter's gone, um, and it is chaos. And Raphael does his con. I put it in my notes because he's sort of he's angry, and he's like. Splinter! And it's kind of like that. Car! 
one moment in, from Star Trek here, and uh, they're, oh, they're, yeah, they're yeah, upset. Yeah, yeah. They, go, yeah, that's a good one. they go back, they, they go to April, and she's like, well, what's going on, guys? And they're like, Splinter's gone. So this is it now. Like They bonded in this one night, and their dad's been kidnapped. Not good. Times are tough for the Ninja Turtles now. I see. Effectively, now, what you—it was one of my favourite plots of a movie is a rescue movie, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? The bad guys have got someone who you love, and you've got to go and get them back. So I love that, and I think that's what what's, what's good in a story. So, got to and go. They've and never been without him. No, that's They're it. Teenage no. movies have never been without their dad. Yeah, they, they don't, They've got no guidance now. Yeah, and uh, you know, he's he's, he's he's a very sort of when I watch this, he's a very sort of cuddly character. Kind of reminds me of my dog. Splinter Aww. when I was watching. Do you know what I mean? I was looking at him, I, I had my dog Smudge next to me and I looked at him and I thought, yeah, you kind of look like this character, dude. Do you know what I mean? He's got that little look on his face. <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's like giving him a little sort of, just sort of smoothing him whilst he's watching this movie. <laughs> he reminds me a little, little bit as well of like something out of Labyrinth as well. Uh, uh, you know, the way you want to give him just a cuddle, don't you? Oh yeah, they did mention this actually. When I looked uh, on the Jim Henson stuff with this, apparently they kind of based him on one of the characters out of the Dark Crystal. You know those... Um, okay. Oh, oh, you know, the, mm. actually the evil mm. characters. Yeah, that's it, the evil characters in it, so, uh, like the crows or whatever. Uh, it's a long time since I've seen that film, mm-hmm. but yeah, they kind of based That's it. Mm. <laughs> Why don't you... I can see that, yeah. like a hairy version of one of them. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Hoggle. No, not Hoggle. <laughs> Um, April finds out that um, not Hoggle Hoggle is Hoggle's friend that's it yeah that's it Um, April finds out um, from her boss that his son is well actually she doesn't find out but we find out as an audience that Danny this is where we find out that her her boss uh, Charlie's son Danny is involved in some kind of criminal activity he steals money out of April's purse doesn't he Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, yeah he's the he gives it back to her at the end. I never noticed that until spoiler alert. I never noticed that until right at the very end. But he says, "Oh, I, here you go." And she's like, "What's this for?" And he's like, "I owe you it. Don't worry about it." I never noticed that before. Yeah, it's funny how you notice stuff like that, isn't it? As a, I suppose, as an adult's perspective of watching these films. But I suppose now, because Splinter's been um, abducted, isn't he? This is where he he reaches out, doesn't he, to Daniel, doesn't he? Because Daniel looks at Splinter, and this is where he kind of yeah. Uh, mediate. He says, you know, what What are you doing in a place like this? You know, mm. you're a young man, you've got your whole life ahead of you. This place is, and this this place, we should probably talk about this place. As a kid, I would have loved to live in this place. It's like a warehouse full of video games. Yeah. They're all smoking and drinking and doing whatever they want. Plus, they're getting taught ninjutsu. Yeah. Man, it's like a paradise, isn't it? Oh, yeah. I mean, this is this is totally 90s, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? This is how, this is how I can't remember it. Because I, I went up to the... Um, I used to go to the Trocadero in London, and it was all like arcades on different floors. And it reminded me a hell of a lot of this place, you know, sort of back in the day. Um, but, yeah, no, it's, it's a great place to hang out. Like I say, that is, that's 90s, isn't it? The technology, we're just sort of bridging over into that technology, wasn't it? You know, no mobile phones, but... Um, high tech Walkmans, stereos, all, the, all that sort of stuff, isn't it? Video games. You had all the skateboard ramps as well, and skateboard and, ramps. Yeah, that's it. So, um, yeah, and that's cool. And uh, in fact, they base they try to as much as they could base this this like warehouse paradise for teenage punks on the fantasy. I can't remember what you call it now. Pleasure Island from Pinocchio. You know where oh, all the boys go and they turn into to donkeys. Yeah. Um, Want to munch on a cigar? And that's why the first shot... (laughs) Well, that's why the first shot you see of this is a young boy munching on a cigar while he's playing pool or whatever he's doing. Are you kidding me? I only just chucked that one in. That's Um, my first... That's my first... Yeah, no, totally. You're on the wavelength there, dude. Oh, I I didn't even... I just said that without thinking. I just just first thing come into my head when I think of that. Oh, that's clever. I didn't know that. Yeah, that kind of makes sense now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's interesting. Uh, and also, Sam Rockwell is in this, isn't he? In the little cameo. Well, not a cameo even. It's like one of his first roles, really. Yeah, he <laughs> um, he kind of takes the lead, doesn't he? Of the game, doesn't he? So he kind of has all the speaking parts, effectively, doesn't he? So, um, yeah. Yeah, he's like the, the main punk, yeah. I guess. 
He's done really well um, for himself as an actor as well, wasn't he? You know, he's sort of Oscar nominated now, isn't he? Three, three billboards movie that he did and all that sort of stuff. He's, he's done a lot of movies. Yeah, he's, he's moved on from some punk in a Ninja Turtles movie up to, yeah, like you say, winning Oscars and stuff. Yeah, he's done he's really right himself. There. Yeah, he's done good, man. Uh, we get to meet Shredder's right-hand man, Tatsu, at this point, and he's yeah. training the children. And it, he's quite harsh with them. He beats the absolute crap out of them. They're only kids. Um, but he does a bit of a Bruce Lee here. Do, do you notice that when he says, uh, the kid bows at the end and he says, don't take your eyes off your enemy. Oh, yeah, I did know. Smashes that. him in that's it. Yeah, the head. That's it. Yeah, 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 that's it. Yeah. Concentrate only on the finger. <laughs> 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 that's it they've got to earn that respect for the <laughs> Foot Clan bandana isn't it that they wear and all that isn't it that's sort of... well if you want to be a ninja if you want to be a ninja there's respect to be earned yeah that's it yeah for that um, mask that they got to wear um, with sort of goggle eyes and all that well Shredder arrives at this point so this is really our first proper look at Shredder um, and he arrives and he gives this big speech saying you know you're all my children i'm your father um and in fact i thought it's funny that he said i am your father yeah i picked up on that as well yeah talking about oh, the star wars it's very darth vader like mm. as well isn't it? yeah that's it i picked up on that as well yeah that's pretty funny that he says that actually um but he basically says you know this is what we're about we're the foot clan we're a family we look after each other but also we're criminals and we steal people's wallets and tvs and mario brothers games so <laughs> yay we're hardcore man stealing wallets <laughs> oh, <dear. laughs> hey master shredder i've got another um crate full of super mario brothers 3 oh excellent <laughs> yeah, do you know what i mean <laughs> uh he oh. does he does, does say to them right at the end of his speech um we do have an enemy out there and i think he says our enemy turtles i can't remember if he says that but um danny danny sort of we see him think oh hang on a minute and actually we missed the scene where the where danny and his dad go around april's and the ninja turtles are all hiding around the apartment which is a oh that's right yeah, funny that's scene. It. yeah because they seem to disappear quite quick didn't they you know he's hiding under a table and he just vanishes down, yeah so yeah that's good to see and then he's in the shower and then he's under the bath and yeah yeah and but danny does spot them so danny now knows who shredder's talking about and and this might this might possibly lead to a slight betrayal in a moment. We yeah. we we'll find out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, what happens next? What well, April says? Hey, do you guys want to see the uh, the antique store that I own? And they're like, Yeah, I guess we've got nothing else to do. Let's go and take a look around your antique store. But Raphael's like, Nah, I'm on the roof and meditate. Um, so while he's meditating on the roof, he is spotted by by chance by casey jones and he's like oh there's that guy that i that big turtle guy that i fought in the park the other day yes yeah, um and this is now the start of a brilliant action thing because suddenly all these ninjas knit foot clan ninjas start crowding around Raphael, and he starts taking them all on there's loads of them and he takes most of them on and casey jones is like what the hell is going on over there i better go over there and see what's going on um so while he's fighting all those guys on the roof, the other turtles are downstairs with April in the in the shop, and she's like, "You sure Raphael's okay? You know, we haven't seen him for a while." That's it. He comes crashing through the ceiling with a bunch of ninjas, <laughs> and this massive fight kicks off, doesn't it? It's a great fight, and I think it, the film really just takes off from here now, doesn't it? In terms of fighting and all that, you know, like say so you got all the Foot Clan turning up, and I love this bit. This is a bit I actually remembered when I revisited this movie. I thought, here we go. The bit where he comes out, it's just where he spins around. He goes around the world, doesn't he? he? Sort of spins around, and they start saying, "Will fortune?" Yeah, he says, he says, sort of "Will of fortune." Um, <laughs> I absolutely loved that back in the nineties because I thought, "Ah, oh, around the world." Because I thought um, at that time, like, you remember those yo-yos that we used to have, the um, yeah, Coca-Cola yeah. Coca ones, Coca-Cola yo-yos, and yep. one of the skills was actually around the world, wasn't it? You had to spin it around, and I thought, "Oh, look, there's a quote." There's something I'm familiar with with the Ninja Turtles. They're doing but something. Because what what's good about this fight, and again, we talked you talked about this earlier. You said mm. it's you never felt too worried about the violence. Is although this is four big guys with shells on their back smashing mm. the crap out of these ninjas. 
to the a bit of fun you know they, they're making silly comments no one's seemingly getting that hurt you know they're crushing them with shells they're smashing into their shells and yeah. throwing them around kicking them through windows but it's fun man and it's and like you said it got around the world and yeah. uh, you know um, wheel of fortune and all these kind of things it's so much fun there's that excellent scene where the guy pulls out his nunchuck oh that's right it's and so mikey's funny. like oh fellow fellow chucker <laughs> <laughs> and he does his nun they go back and forth back and forth trying to outdo each other yeah. and, and behind mikey while well, he's the last bit is mikey's just spinning it on one finger Oh, that's right. That's it. Yeah. That's and it. Uh, yeah. behind him, you just got Donny. Sort of Donatello is just sort of leaning on, him, going, "Yeah, he's pretty badass. That's my brother, Mikey." It's so good. It's just yeah. like, oh, I felt like a kid watching it. It's so good. It's like a sort of dance off, isn't it? Or like a, a rapper sort of dance off or whatever. Isn't it? it like is doing that, you know, with this whole nunchuck off. Thing. Yeah, n- nunchuck off, and I think that just goes with the tone of the movie, doesn't it? You know, and everything. So, yeah, it's just great. It's a brilliant. And the other thing is, Dan, is I, I can't really compare this fight or these scenes to anything else I'd almost say it's unique no. do you know what I mean I can't really say oh it's like this It's it kind of holds its own doesn't it do you know what I mean this movie I think in a way yeah it's very unique um, it's well choreographed great yeah. action and, and they're doing it all in rubber suits so yeah, you're right it. I think that's it, probably it. it you know it's just yeah. <laughs> it's brilliant and it's got humour in it as well. It's got humour in it because the other thing they're trying to do is they're trying to make sure they can, they keep saying to each other while they're fighting, make sure you don't knock them all out. We need to keep one of them conscious so mm. we can ask him, you know, questions about Shredder um, and where, where Splinter is. But they keep knocking them all out because they're just busting them all up. It's so funny. Yeah. It's hilarious. Um, Casey Jones turns up um, and... The floor collapses because basically they've like the fl- they've got axes and the whole floor is getting destroyed, and eventually the whole floor caves in and they all fall through downstairs into the basement. And this is where Casey Jones turns up, and uh, um, somebody says, one of the turtles says, says, "Who's that?" And the other guy says, "Wayne Gretzky on steroids." <laughs> <laughs> oh man, it's I love right. that. Yeah, it's fantastic. And unfortunately for April now, a giant fire starts, uh, which really it just starts burning down her entire family antique store. So the, t- the four turtles, Casey Jones and April, all managed to just about manage to escape. Just before they escape, Casey hears um, an answer machine message from April's boss saying, you're fired. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's <laughs> so, it. Yeah. It's going to have to break that news through later on, which isn't going to be great. <laughs> so that's just what you want, didn't you, when your place is burning down, isn't it? Just an answer machine game. Oh, by the way, you're fired. Brilliant, fantastic. You've had a, my, my day couldn't get any worse. A, <laughs> <laughs> you've, had a, you've had a gang of ninjas come yeah. into your, your family antique store and burn it to the ground. <laughs> then your boss rings you and says, oh, you're fired. That is, that, is a, that is a weird day, isn't it? Yeah, that is one weird that's, day. That's, that is a crap day. That is what that is. It's like you say, someone comes up to you and says, oh, what happened in your day? Oh, I got fired. Oh, that's bad news. Do you want to hear what else happened as well? <laughs> House burned down, Ninja Turtles, Foot Clan, guy in a skate suit or whatever, you know, Casey Jones, boom. Yeah. <laughs> that's a, that's almost a bit of a Jack Burton day, isn't it, really? You know, you, you, you try and get your money off your friend Wang and uh, you end up getting your truck stolen. Oh, you get blinded yeah. briefly. And... Uh, yeah, the whole if day it, goes to hell. You could just have Jack Burton in the background. Yeah, yeah, Shredder. Now you see him. Now you don't, tall guy. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and that is who Casey Jones does remind me of. He has got a Jack Burtonness about him because he is trying to be cocky. Yeah, uh, and he's trying to be an action hero, and yeah. he is an action hero. But he's trying to be an action hero too. You know, he's trying to come out with one-liners, um, and. It's, it's, that's who he reminds me of. Yeah, yeah he, he is. I, I'll give him that. He is actually uh, he is another Jack Burton character, isn't he? And I'll be honest with you, there's not many people I would give that credit to. But he does actually pull that off, doesn't he, in this? So, yeah, I'll give that to him. So, it, it works really well. Casey Jones gets the RJ McCready approval. He I gets, like that. Yeah, he gets the RJ boom. Just uh, ring that bell now. Yeah, or whatever. Or... <laughs> ding, 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 ding. <laughs> um, yeah. So, we get this like bit of a... Um, a time to catch our breath now as an audience because mm. quite a lot's happened. Oh, yeah. So we go off now, we drive out to the country and April's family own a um like a farm out in the middle of middle of nowhere really. And this is just a chance because Raphael's 
really badly injured, isn't he? We should mention. He's yes, been he is. Yeah, completely yeah. knocked unconscious, and he's he takes a lot of time to recover. And uh, Leonardo keeps vigil outside the room. Um, Michelangelo uh, and Donatello are sort of goofing off. Mikey and Casey Jones become pretty close. Actually, they they sort of play this game where they're sort of insulting each other, going through different letters of the alphabet, which is really fun. <laughs> um, and April's. April's kind of doing a journal, but it's more of a voiceover, and she's sort of sketching the turtles while she sort of talks about their relationship with each other and how they're all missing Splinter's essentially their dad. So it's a really great exposition scene and a really great chance for us to catch our breath and just understand a little bit more about what all these characters are going mm, through. It's really well I, done, isn't it? Yeah, that's what I mean. That's what I, that's what I noticed. One of the things I wrote down the character development in this film. They don't shy away from it. They give everybody that chance, don't they? To sort of broaden out a little bit and throw in an action scene and then like say throw in a scene like this where they're you know in a farmhouse a little bit more development and then we'll go on to another fight scene do you know what i mean so they are packing in a lot in this movie like you say and then of course I you don't get, know how they did it no and then of course you get old uh, casey jones now then he just he can't really speak to april o'neill can he but he just thinks i know i'll just give her a little massage <laughs> he, he tries he tries everything doesn't he? Yeah, he does, first yeah. of all he puts his foot in it by telling her in a very blunt way that she's been fired oh you don't need to worry about going back to new york you've been fired <laughs> that's it yeah great and then he does he has another jack burton moment doesn't he? he goes he's sort of walking around he's trying to chat her up he goes oh hell with it and then he sits in that is it like a chair or something? <laughs> it's like it just, a swing. It just, just swing, it? Just, just breaks, didn't it? It's just boom, and he's like, whoa! <laughs> it's so funny. And then, he, like you said, he tries to give her a massage as well. Yeah. yeah um, just... he she eventually lets him, just because she's very tense, you know. And it's it's not anything dodgy. It's just, no, it's, no, it's just no, no, tense. No. You know, he's actually cooking dinner. Uh, using one of Leonardo's swords to cut vegetables, which yeah, I love. Yeah, that's it. That's what I noticed as well, wasn't it? Yeah, he's cutting it. <laughs> that's what you're doing, it, you know. <laughs> and then Mike, Mikey comes in, and when she's getting a massage, and he's like rubbing his shoulder, and she's like, "Are you alright?" He's like, "Oh, I'm just a bit stiff." She's like, "Do you want some oil?" And he's like, "No, I use turtle wax." Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, get like a, a little wee egg there, didn't you? Turtle wax, sea stuff. Well, that's quite clever. Yeah, that was good. So. Um, the Casey's trying to fix the truck, yeah. really, so they can go back to to, to New York. So, <laughs> yeah, you know, um, I was just, sorry, Dad, I was just going to say, t- when you, when you want to fix a truck in a movie, all you need is a spanner. Do you know what I mean? That's all you need. You just open it up and just That's go. All they ever use. Yeah, right. Let, I'll fix it. Hang on. It's all. Wait, 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 wait. Right, start it up now. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, someone always says, you need two of you, right? So yeah. I'll be the guy in the, the cockpit, in the in the hub, in the, you know, in the seat, and you're leaning out. Yeah. And all you, you always say the same thing. You always lean out and you go, okay, try it now. Okay. And I go, so, oh, it's it. not going to work. <laughs> oh, you've done it. it. <laughs> Works every time. I must, I must, I need one of those Hollywood spanners for my car. Next time my car's not working. Go get that hot Every spanner. time. Yeah, that's it. Just give something a little tweak. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. That's it. That's it, done. <laughs> I love it. Okay, oh. try it now. Try it now. <laughs> <laughs> and then who's, who's in there? Is it Raphael again? He just starts, is he just dries off? Or is it Donatello? Uh, no, it's Donatello, yeah. Donatello, um, seen it, yeah. Raphael does wake up, though. So Raph oh, yeah, because Raph's up. Raph's and he's sort of like that. scratching his head. Like, what happened? Um, so the brothers are reunited, and they... they focus now on what their mission is which is to rescue shredder and they start training we got these montages of them training and fighting each other and you know april's narrating over the top of it and it's done really well it's not done in a cheesy cringy way at all no. it's done in a really great way and um yeah they, they gain their strength back um shredder does say at one point we cut back to them briefly and he says something about the way that those turtles were fight was fighting really bothers me and his sort of second in command tetsu is like well, what was what it and he's like i recognize their fighting style from somewhere and i can't oh, place yeah. the fighting style but it's that's right it's, yeah. uh, is this yeah. where you, is this where you get another... then we get the obi-wan kenobi moment that's right do you get another sort of backstory now do you with splinter is he talking about how he got all these skills or something or yeah, he tells Danny, doesn't he? He says, um, basically, I was a rat. I was, my, me and my master came to America for a girl, and the girl was also, Shredder was also, or- Orokusaki, which is Shredder's oh, real name, was yeah, also in love with the girl. Um, 
he killed my master. I scratched his face because I was a rat. Mm. And then he sliced my ear. And then I landed in the ooze, found the turtles. I became a mutant rat. They became ninja turtles. And I'm a ninja. <laughs> it's kind of a weird That's story. That's pretty much it. Kid, there you really, go. You... That's it. There you go. That's what happened, man. And there's where the kid goes, wow, you know. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> got, I got that. I got that, yeah. Um, just, Splinter... Yeah. Yeah, he tells Danny all of that stuff. And then um, the, the turtles sit around a campfire and they communicate and they do try and communicate with Shred with uh, Splinter. And he, they do actually, whether they whether it's hallucination or whether it's real or what, but they get a message, which is, I'm very proud of you all and I know that you'll do the right thing. Mm. He says something along those lines. So they're like, okay, well, it's time to go back to New York now. It's time to kick some ass, aren't it? It's time to go back and bust up some ninjas. That's yep. what they do. That is what the Ninja Turtles do. Yeah, like I say, you get that sort of final fight scene now, don't you, in there, with the Foot Clan and all that, don't you, say? So. Oh, yeah. Um, Casey, uh, they, they go back to their sewer lair and Casey's sort of moaning about the sewers. That's what I'm saying. He's the comic relief. He's like, oh, I can't believe you guys live down here. This is disgusting. I'm, I'm claustrophobic. And he ends up sleeping in the truck because he's claustrophobic. He yeah, won't that's stay it. in the sewers. Yeah. Um. <laughs> And I like the way he sort of opens up the window, didn't he? To sort of presumably let some fresh air in, but he's in a sewer, so I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But yeah, I suppose, yeah, Poor like, Casey. So, the more I think about it now, he is Jack Burton, isn't he, in this film? Like, he's getting another Jack Burton role in him. <laughs> yeah, because he's trying to be the tough guy, but. Yeah, nothing really seems to be working out for him, does it? <laughs> oh, dear. Not really. You were not put on this earth to get it, Mr. Burton. Oh man, that's brilliant! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that quote. Oh dear. It's a good. It will come. No, I'm not going to start going into it. I'm not going to go into it. What? What? <laughs> Two thousand years. You can't find one bird. Was it bored to fit the bill? Come on, Wayne. You must be doing something seriously wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Henry Swanson's my name, and oh, excitement's my game. <laughs> First time you ever plugged somebody? <laughs> oh, I know what you mean. My wife gave it me for Christmas. Yeah, that's it, yeah. Oh, dear. <laughs> anyway, anyway. This is what happens. As soon as you start bringing up Big Trouble in Little China, man, that's it. It's just these quotes just come flooding out, and they? Yeah, that's it. Oh, so, um, Shredder um, grabs Danny back at the the paradise warehouse and he finds a drawing of uh one of the turtles on him yeah so he it. knows because danny got it from them when because danny was hiding out in the ninja's lab when, yeah. the ninja turtles lab when they got back so he now says right okay you know i, I know what's going on now this is fine so the, the, the kind of we start establishing who's the goodies who's the baddies they all know about each other a bit and we get that backstory you mentioned as well um, and I love the bit where uh, Shredder grabs the pe- the picture, and then he just turns around and says, "They're back." That's kind of it's just so cheesy, but done so well. I love yeah. it. <laughs> oh, uh, Casey and Danny, so they all head in. Casey and Danny rescue Splinter. Yeah. Um, they get they unhook him, and they and this is where it looks incredible. This is what you were talking about at the beginning. The effects, mm. isn't it? Yeah, I just I, I must admit, after re-watching this the other day, I couldn't believe how good these special effects are. Really, really good. Yeah, really because good they pick him up like he's a real... Mm. If you can imagine what a three-foot-tall rat mutant would look like, that's kind of, you know, and there's, it's seamless. I can't see any puppeteers or strings. It's talking away, you know. This yeah. is 1990. Yeah. It's not, there's no CGI. It no. Just, and, you've, and you've got a small budget for this film as well, not to forget. That is a small budget. That's only thirteen million dollars. That's you know, it's um I think another film called you know, Howard the Duck. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, I love that movie. Yeah, that you covered great. that with uh, Gary, didn't you? Yeah, Gary Hill and Rick uh, did that for Dude that's like the eighties. But we um So they came out in nineteen eighty six and that was twenty five million dollars, just to give you an idea. Wow. So, do you know what I mean? I think we actually mentioned that on the show with the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And that's the other thing, I think um just on a slight segue, I, we did say uh, Howard the Duck was the revolution of animatronic, animatronics, which would then enable Jim Henson to do what he did with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. 
So yeah. what they used there kind of bridged over. So, um, but there you go. Good old Howard the Duck, eh? <laughs> good old, good old Duck. Howard the, <laughs> the Duck. duck. Do, 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 do. Yeah. Prince really did write every song for the eighties, mate. I tell you, when you listen to that. <laughs> Quack um, foo. Well, I'll tell you what, Dan, that's supposed to be a kid's movie, but in the first like two minutes, you've got a duck condom. Do you know what I mean? And, yeah, and a woman, a duck woman with her boobs out in the bath. Let's not forget that. You get duck tees in the first five minutes, mate. <laughs> <laughs> also, also, um, there's a, such a dodgy scene in that movie where mm. Leah Thompson is, looks like she's about to like hook up with a duck, yeah, and it's yeah. like, uh, yeah, yeah. Even as a kid, I was like, no, mm-hmm. this is uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Watching that movie with your parents, yeah, as your kids, yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> that film really didn't know where it wanted to be, man. It's a good movie, but it just didn't know where it wanted to be. <laughs> and that was the 80s, man. Some movies just didn't know where to put themselves, did they, in the 80s? That was, that was just the way it went, really. <laughs> oh, dear. Anyway, so, back to the Foot Clan, so, uh, Shredder's <laughs> Warehouse. To, yeah. So the, yeah. The Foot Clan storm the sewer lair, and um, we get we now get a couple of little fights breaking out. So Casey starts taking on Tetsu, the bold mm. guy who's um, Shredder's main uh, henchman, and they have a fantastic uh, fight backwards and forwards. Uh, in the end, he ends up using his golf club on him, yeah. cracking him in the head, yeah. and saying, "I'll never call golf a dull game again." Yeah, because I like that. Because as you said earlier, you know, Casey Jones, that is one of his weapons that he has in the comics, isn't it, I think? Uh, golf yep. club. So he's got, you know, as you said, the cricket bat and the um, baseball bat and all that. And Yeah, so it's pretty good how they just chuck that in as well. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah, it takes him out. Yeah, it's brilliant. Uh, the, turtles, the turtles fight all of the ninja clan. And this fight, um, they basically start overpowering the ninjas, even though there's only four turtles. They're so badass that they take out, take on all these guys. And the fight spills out onto the street. They chase them out onto the, the street, out of the sewers. And they end up climbing up onto a rooftop. Um, they, they fight on the rooftops. And at one point, Raphael's having, um, Michelangelo's having so much fun. He just kind of looks up into the sky and screams, God, I love being a turtle! Yeah, Because <laughs> like, it's it. just kicking so much ass. It's yeah, brilliant. Yeah, they actually um, use that um, uh, phrase quite a lot, don't they, in the music soundtrack as well, I think, as a sort of remix. Yeah, God, I love again. being a turtle! I remember that sort of yeah, being played it's over. It's like, did it, did it, did it, did it, God, I love being a turtle! Did it, did it, did it, that's it, yeah, that's it. It's a good mix, it's a good mix. Yeah. Uh, so the turtles, we're heading to the climax now, so the turtles head up onto the roof, and this is where they face the Shredder. And um, he takes them all on one by one, initially, and he beats them all one by one as well. Uh, you know, and there's that's a right. great fight scene, really. This is choreographed really well. Mm. Really intense. Um and they try, you know, but no one can really seem to overpower him one by one or all together. Then just having no luck at all. Uh, he makes them throw their weapons over the side. So this is the thing. If they'd have had their weapons, maybe they could fight him. But he's made them throw their weapons over the side. Um, and Shredder, uh, Splinter shows up and he's, he, said, he reveals, I know who you are, Rokusaki. And so Shredder reveals, he takes his mask off and he's got great big scars down his face from where the rat attacked him when he was younger or a few years ago and this is what this is it it's the rivalry between splinter and shredder that's the main thing it's not the turtles it's splinter and the shredder that's it yeah and i was quite surprised there because they don't actually um the turtles don't actually beat shredder do they no um they just don't do it do they they try but it's actually like you say splinter isn't it who takes them on They've got a lot to learn, RJ. I think mm. I think that's the amazing as well. Is that they're just teenagers that you know who are great at ninjutsu, but they couldn't beat someone like the Shredder, and he's got spikes all over him as well. Let's not forget that as well. You yeah. know, not only is he great at ninja, but he's got spikes all over him as well. That's it, and I think it's quite a brave move in terms of storytelling. And you've got this big move, even with the Ninja Turtles and the bad guy. Um, but the fact that they, you know, whoever's making this movie has made that decision to say we're not actually going to have the turtles beaten. Yeah, I'm gonna, I think I'm that's gonna, brilliant. I think that's a really brave, good move, you know, to say, you know, let's not make this predictable. And it's, you know, well, it's true it's to the story memory. because yeah. the story is essentially Splinter versus Shredder. That's the, the rivalry. Oh, and is it's it? true oh, to right. that. Okay, right. Okay, yeah, that's good. I like that. It's, it's, mm. Well, that sort of 
going on. Some of the ninjas try and climb up a, a like a fire escape ladder to, um, you know, assist Shredder. But uh, Casey spots this. So he goes off and jumps in a dump truck and reverses it into the ladder and knocks them all off the, off the ladder and onto the floor. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> you see, they're still, just, they're still throwing the comic relief here, don't they? Even in the he's just helping comments. out. Well, he's got one of my best lines in a minute, coming up in just a moment. Um, because Shredder runs at Splinter for Blast to sort of, you know, take him on. But Sh- Splinter is such a badass, so calm and collected. He's got... Um, I believe he's got uh, Michelangelo's nunchucks uh, on a stick swinging around and he just turns to the side, knocks Shredder over the edge of the roof and Shredder falls off the building and he's like just holding on to the building. And uh, he says that the difference is between you and me is honour or something like that and, and, and Shredder falls to his death but he lands in the back of the dump truck and just as he lands in the dump truck this is my favorite line is when casey just leans on the lever to switch on the crushing mechanism in the back of it and he goes whoops <laughs> <laughs> he's oh, quite happy to kill the shredder yeah, and just crush it. him yeah, in the back of this dump truck pretty mad isn't it really when you think about it you know crushing this dude up in the dust cart man <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, that's it. Um, April, April's, uh, April shows up, um, and so do loads of reporters, as they always do. And this happened in um, Enter the Dragon. Like I said to you, the last ten seconds, everybody shows up. Well, it's too late now, guys. It's all over. Yeah, that's um, typical. Everybody turns oh. up at the end, don't they? <laughs> in these movies, yeah, that's it. Cavalry always turns up at the end. But yeah, these good reporters turn up. Uh, the chief of police shows up. Uh, April gets her job back. She gets a raise. She gets a corner office that she wants. Um, great scene now. And this is uh, listening to you and Ricky talking about Big Trouble. I always forget that Jack, for some reason, decides to not kiss Kim Cattrall and then just goes off. Yeah. But that doesn't happen in this. It's, you know, in the end, uh, Casey Jones is talking and talking and talking and talking. And, and April just says, why don't you just shut up and kiss me? Yeah, and it's yeah. brilliant. She takes the lead. She's such a badass. She takes the lead. Shut up and kiss me. And he does. And what a great ending Love to it. a move, isn't it? It's the kind of like where it closes now, isn't it? So it's just... And... Yeah, the turtles just sort of celebrate, really. They go back to the sewer lair. They're practicing different catchphrases, you know. And, uh, and I love the fact that they haven't said it throughout the whole movie, actually. And then at oh, the yeah, very end, they're yeah. all coming up with radical, bodacious, da da da, and whatever it is. But none of them can agree on the best catchphrase for the situation. And Splinter just looks around and says, I've always liked Cowabunga. That's and they it. all look and they go, Yay, Cowabunga! <laughs> In fact, you're right. I think that's the only time they mention it throughout the movie, isn't it? Is, that, is it Cowabunga? I think that's the only time, yeah. yeah. Um, I like weirdly, Cowabunga. That was like a that was a Bart Simpson catchphrase originally. That was like when he came out in eighty eight, eighty nine. That was his catchphrase. Do you remember? See, I wasn't much of a Bart Simpson do guy, but I can't remember that. Um, but was it really? Yeah, was it? Yeah. Oh, well, okay. I mean, it's originally a, it's originally a surfing catchphrase. Like oh, people okay. would say, Cowabunga do. But um, yeah, man. And then as the credits roll, RJ, we launch into a little bit of T U R T L E power. Partners in crime. And that's the other Man. thing as well. I said uh, I said this to Rick with uh, Big Trouble. A film can be just as good as the ending song. Do you know what I mean? You sort of get to the end of this movie. Absolutely. And then you've got this uh, song just to sort of... How can I say it? Just sort of bookends it. Do you know what I mean? Just really well. Do you know what I mean? Because so, so, you remember what you made when you was like 12 years old. You sit at the cinema and you sort of just walking out. And you could just hear this pumping in the background. You're thinking, oh, I just watched the film. I feel like a teenage mutant ninja turtle and you just you know, it's just it's just great, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? It's just a real Well, I'll tell you what, I came out of the cinema and immediately demanded that my parents bought me the cassette uh, yeah. album of the you know, the soundtrack. Yeah. And I got it within a few weeks really, you know. Was, I had to have that soundtrack. And I listened to it so many times. It was one of those times, you know. It was, I remember it's it being, so good. I remember it being everywhere, everywhere I went. Do you remember um you, I think you remember it, remember Woolworths? <laughs> Yeah, oh yeah, 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 yeah. It was everywhere. Course, it was, I just went in there. It was in there, wasn't it? Posters and Yeah, I just saw the teenage like I say, the, the vinyls and everything and um this was it, you know, it was, it was big deal. Big deal. And I, um, I remember sort of asking whoever I was with when I came out of the cinema, when will that come out on video? 
And they were like, well, we've only just watched it literally just this second. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, but when will it come out on video? Because I really want to get that on video for my birthday or for Christmas. Will it be out for this Christmas? I don't know. I don't know, Daniel. Oh, but I need, I need it. I need it. I need it. You don't need it. No, I do. I need it on video. <laughs> you don't understand. <laughs> yeah, this is it. Yeah, yeah. No, it was good times, man. <laughs> it was good times. I mean, like I say, then I think you mentioned this the other day. You, then we had... A string of other movies come on. Did we have Dick Tracy? Didn't we after this? Um, Dick Tracy. What? Yeah. What does, yeah. We, yeah. We did. Yeah. We had that. Um, Super Mario Brothers came out, didn't it? So all of a sudden the attention went on to studios going, "We need to make movies about, you know, comic books and stuff like that." So we then we got, you know, yeah, uh, comic, comic books, movies. video games, kids, sort of. Because there is money to be made in it, you know, mm. and, and no one could no one could quite do it like these guys. Like, I'm quite surprised that you said this is one of the... But then I'm not surprised. You said this is one of the sort of highest grossing independent or most successful independent movies of all time. That doesn't surprise me, actually, because if no one was taking a chance on, on the studio, and yet Jim Henson were willing to chuck in some... Jim Henson Studios were willing to chuck in some puppetry. Yeah. Of course that movie was going to make money. Yeah. I bet the studios that passed up on it. And, yeah, like I say, I'm glad they did. Absolutely and, uh, kicking themselves. Yeah. And like I say, the um, uh, film director, was it John Bryan? I think his name was. Uh, uh, Steve Barron. Yeah, yeah, Steve oh, Barron. I was almost there with it. <laughs> 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 that's, me, that's my Jack Burton moment. Um, he, he, so the reason why, the other reason why I think we've got this, because I can, you can almost compare this movie to like an MTV movie, kind of, do you know what I mean? Just the way it's... the the whole aesthetic um oh yeah it's, it's trying stuff. to appeal to that new that 90s audience that nobody really knew what the 90s audience was at this point so no. it's trying to appeal to those guys isn't it so um the director he actually he was involved in lots of music videos so that was his building block so he did like um madonna um i think he did music oh, videos all, all, every sort of 80s band that you can think of he was involved with so that's certainly you can certainly see that in this film, you know, with his style of making movies and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, it's great. It's just, uh, like I say, you had Batman in 1989, didn't you? It was like a, kind of like a sort of saying goodbye to the 80s and then Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, hello 90s. Boom. Yeah. There you go. That's it. Um, I think if, so, in, in actual yeah, fact, I think if someone said to just, me, you know, if said, oh, Jay, um, give me a movie that's the 90s I'll probably say go and watch Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles <laughs> yeah totally man totally and like you said you touched on this very early in, in our conversation you said mm. everything was about the sewers or toxic you know you know, all those movies were about mutation and, and mutants and sewers and this was just the epitome of it plus you throw in ninjas you know um, and cool sort of hip lingo and catchphrases we're all there. We love it. Yeah, that's and it. And they're yeah. teenagers. It's a whole ton of fun. Here's a thumbs up from me, man. Yeah, it gets three turtle fingers up from me. <laughs> <laughs> Plus, it's got Corey Feldman in it, man. Come on, he does the voice of Donatello. Yeah, that How dude, good is that? That dude was everywhere. And talking about Corey Feldman, we're actually talking about doing one of his movies, aren't we? It's our next film together. Indeed, I'm more than happy to come back and talk to you about... Can I reveal it? Ooh. Take it away, Dan. Boom. Lost Boys. Yeah. Oh, man. What a movie. I mean, I'll say... I'll, yeah. I'll save it, but I mean... It, it's one of those films, I don't know, it's just every time I turn it on... I don't watch it all the time, but do, when I do watch it... I think you said it on your last episode, Dan. It's one of those films you want to watch in the summertime. Probably like tonight, really. I'm sweating. Um, it's hot and yep. it kind of it, it how can I put it it just makes you feel like you're in that environment you know I mean you're in Santa Cruz or Santa Carla and you're oh yeah and all that oh sort yeah of stuff. And, um, so yeah yeah we'll get into that we'll, I'll save all that I've got a few things I can tell you about that movie as well which I'll save for the next show I'm looking forward to that movie. It's got Corey Haim, Corey Feldman, Kiefer Sutherland in it. And obviously, mm. we'll, the, the reason you asked if we wanted to talk about it is because, unfortunately, Joel Schumacher passed away. So it'll be a nice little way to honour yes. him, won't it? Yeah, that's right. That. Yeah, so um, we will we will honour the director and we will talk about that movie. So, yeah, thanks, Dan. Like I say, thanks for coming on board again today, mate. Um, I've had a ton of fun, mate. 
Um, I couldn't think of anybody better to review this movie with because I know you know how, how much a fan you are of this movie. So thanks a lot, buddy. Well, I'm sorry if I geeked out a bit too much, but you know me, I love my pop culture and my God, I love the Ninja Turtles. No, this is what so. it's all about. So <laughs> um, just before we close the show, mate, um, so you and Gav, what, what's your next uh, show for a podcast on Haunted Hill? Or I know you've just done a real awkward movie, didn't you? <laughs> the Cannibal Holocaust. And yeah, so we just covered um, yeah. Cannibal Holocaust uh, yeah, and Ravenous. Um, mm. Cannibal Holocaust is one of those sort of movies that should probably never be seen really mm. but it's also one of those movies that is vitally important in the horror genre for many reasons so it's a real really it's an interesting conversation we did we got a lot more out of that than we thought we would but um yeah i've never seen it that, that never... was what we've just done and our next episode oh i mean do i tell you to watch it or not it's really up to you you heard my thoughts on it really you know i've hopefully reviewed it enough that you probably don't have to watch it no but I won't. I if won't you watch feel it. like you want to put yourself for it no, i won't <laughs> no. I, uh, yes it's one of those times where it's I'm, I'm thankful for you guys to review it so i don't need to watch it so do you know what i mean it's i'm kind of getting what yeah. you guys are saying but it's yeah real awkward movie hmm. yeah it's not fun it's not it's not an easy it's it, yes. yeah it's, very, it's an experience but our next uh, episode we're doing Next episode, I'm really excited for because we're covering. So we're doing a whole Black Lives Matter special, right? Special. I'm celebrating um, Black horror and people within horror. Yeah. Um, so we're doing Get Get Out and Candyman, which is going to be awesome because Get Out is an incredible movie, um, and Candyman is not one you really get hearing people talk about very often. I don't know why because it's it's a bit of a cult movie. Yeah. Um, so we're going to be covering those two next. Uh, um, which is going to be really exciting and um all of our money that we get from patreon for that episode for that month we are going to be doubling with our own money and then donating to the cause black lives matter so oh, no, we're great, really man. excited yeah, and very man. proud to be doing that yeah well. no that, that's really good. and i know you guys are getting a lot of buzz for what you're doing there so yeah i totally respect that man so that's, that's great great what you're doing um and that, that, that's one of the things i love about legion in on the whole as well with what bo ranzel has been doing with uh he's you know, with this time that we're going through with the, the epidemic and all that sort of stuff, and he's put a, I know he's trying yeah. to put some money together to help people out. So yeah, it's it's just a great thing to be a part of. So it's good stuff that people are, you know, reaching out like. It's that, a great, so. great, great family that we're all mm, part of, isn't absolutely, it? Absolutely, man. Yeah, it's just a great bunch of people. So uh, yeah, good stuff, man. All right, and Dan. Well, I will look forward to getting back to uh, talking another movie with you, mate, with the Lost Boys and all that. But um, just before we end the show, guys, absolutely. Um, I'm going to be back soon. I'm actually got um, I've got Court Sarps coming onto the show, <laughs> and we're going to be doing Return of the Living Dead. So that's going to be the next episode we're going to be having a look at. And nice. I, I, I haven't actually decided which film I'm going to be doing yet as a solo. So I will pick one out of the bag, and I'm sure I will think of something. So there'll be something coming soon. Um, but as always, guys, I'm a proud member of Legion Podcast, so please go and check out all the other shows, including Dan's show, Podcast on Haunted Hill. And you can find my show on uh, Spotify, iTunes, um, and YouTube, and several other players on the internet if you put in Bite Size Cinema Podcast Legion. i also got a Facebook page. Um, go and check that out. Post some stuff on there. We have some fun on there. Put some movies on there. If there's anything you want me to review, I'll go and check it out. So... There you go, guys. Going to be closing the show. So, as always, keep it bite size, keep it safe, and cowabunga, dude. <laughs> cowabunga, dude. <laughs> See you later. show then make sure you check out the other great shows on the legion podcast network like cinema psyops cinema beef devour the podcast duncan and Bo come correct exploding heads horror movie podcast friday the 13th get slayed the hell Ming power hour hello this is the doom show hero hero ghost show kill the cast underwater kaiju from outer space jerry hates action 
Legion After Dark, Mental Health, Obsessive Cinema, Discourse, Pick 6 Movies, The Podcast by the Cemetery, The Podcast on Haunted Hill, The Psycho Semantic Podcast, Rick Radio, House of Wax, Dude Looks Like the 80s, Rabbit and Red Radio, The Shade Cast, Short Bus Cinema, Two Drink Minimum Commentaries, The VD Clinic, Who Will Survive Horror Podcast, and Which Versus the Doomsday Clock. With such a widespread of shows, there is guaranteed to be a niche for you to fall in love with. Horror, politics, movies, books, sex, music, commentaries, health, video games, kaiju, action, news, comedy, and opinions that would most likely get you killed in some parts of the world. We are proud to bring you some of the best podcasting in the world. Check us out at www.legionpodcast.com, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, and any other dark corner of the internet where podcasts can be found.